We're heading back to 1978 for the debut album from a group that virtually defined new wave music. If you looked at the title of the episode, you already know what it is. If not, stay with us. We'll be right back. Get ready for the 3324 podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 podcast. Music and movies galore. Hundreds of hundreds of episodes, we can say now. Yeah. Hundreds. Yeah. We can, okay. can we? You can Let's, uh, sort through, you know, sort through them. And uh, we'll, we'll leave it to you to pick and choose which ones you want to check out first. Uh, but there's a lot there to go back for. So by all means, after this one, have at it. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you do that? You listen to podcasts, right? You don't go in order. If you, Like if when I find a new podcast, I'll scroll through and say, okay, well, what's. No. You know, yeah. You tr you're always looking check for that first? one. Yeah. That one episode. Yeah, the, that, the grabber. The grabber. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the one that, oh, yeah, I want to see that. I want to listen to that. Yep. So, uh, yeah, same thing here. You know, go ahead and, and check out what we've got to offer, the back catalog, as it were. Uh, there's plenty there. And then there's always new stuff every week coming out. So, um, dare I say, Eric, we're prolific. <laughs> we're prolific, right? We are. True. That's a, tr that's a, we're that's a fair prolific. statement. Yeah, I think so. We're prolific podcasters. <laughs> I stand by that. Stand by that. And we're going to continue our prolificness, if that's a word, this <laughs> week with uh, with the an album. Wow. Uh, this band actually referred to this album. They said this album could be just our greatest hits. Yeah. Um, because it's it's one of those that that from a from a debut artist, um, a, a lot of things going on with this album from the cars. So the group is the cars. Uh, the debut album is just called the cars. Uh, and it came out in 1978. So we'll get, we'll get rolling with the stats uh, released in June of 1978 produced, produced by Roy Thomas Baker, who would reproduce most of their material. Uh, there were three singles released uh, for this album. Uh, Just what I needed hit number 27. My best friend's girl hit number 35. Good times roll hit 41. But there were four other songs that were radio hits, FM radio hits. Yeah, staples. Uh, and these should, yeah, these should not sound unfamiliar. You're all I've got tonight. Mm -hmm. Bye bye love, uh, and moving in stereo. So you've got another three songs that were just kind of uh, the FM staples that that you would always hear on the radio. This is kind of like that. This is kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, almost like much like Billy Joel, the Stranger. Yeah. Right. Yep. That was. Boom, 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 boom. And this is the same thing, but it's from a debut artist, which is uh, even more incredible that, that this amount. Uh, it hit number 18 on the Billboard charts. It spent 139 weeks on the charts. So this was, you know, this was, you know, as Ron Burgundy said, kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, it went six times, it went six times platinum. Yeah. That's in excess of 6 million copies. Again, for a debut album in the 70s, this is a lot. That's a lot of copies like going out the door. Uh, it's a big thing. Uh, and the cars were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2018. Um, and that would actually be the last performance with Rick Ocasek, who was one of the leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. So while, while we're there, let, let's just talk about the who is in the cars. We'll kind of get that done. Uh, you've got Rick Ocasek, who's... Kind of a you know the the cars were kind of a, a, a visually striking band because of Rick Ocasek, right, Eric? Yeah, uh, unusual looking. A, a, a beam pole of a guy who's very yeah. tall, very <laughs> thin. He's got a giant. He doesn't have an Adam's apple. He's got an Adam's pineapple. Like just <laughs> like he's lanky, jet black hair. Uh, just a very strike, very spidery. Yeah, right. Like a, ver a very striking. Uh, striking uh, countenance that he that he had. Um, so and he was he was the main songwriter, not the only one, but the main one. Uh, Benjamin Orr on on bass, who passed away uh, in two thousand, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, then you've got Elliot Easton on guitar, David Robinson on drums, and Greg Hawks on keyboard. So you got the a standard kind of like five member kind of group. Mm -hmm. um, in the seventies, I was I was kind of thinking about. It. I'm like, oh, this is kind of like Sticks. 
with the yeah. setup of the band. The setup, yeah. not the sound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not the sound. No, right. that, most decidedly not the sound, right? Yeah. But you've got the two guitars, the keyboardist, mm-hmm. bass player, and drummer. So it's kind of like that five five uh, person setup with with the keyboard enhancements. So it's a really uh, a really interesting thing for for that. And I was thinking about that. You know, we think about the maybe you could tell me the. When I, when you say the cars, do you think the seventies or do you think the eighties? Definitely the eighties, right? They had that. Yeah. They have that feel. They have that. Definitely, yeah, Mo, yeah. I mean, they were. This right out the gate was um, probably the first true new wave album that I actually heard. I think it was this and Gary yep. Newman. Yeah, with his song, yeah, this- you know, cars. Uh, ironically, (laughs) um, but yeah, it was almost, I mean, in a, in a way I always thought that, you know, I didn't know back then who, who was who, you know, so Gary Newman might've been in the cars, um, you know, for all, for all (laughs) intents and purposes, you know, um, but yeah, but 78 kind of blew my mind. And, but when I, when I really listened to the album, the one thing that I think of and is when I moved to Dobbs Ferry Uh in 78. So this album was huge. Uh, so I just look at, I'm looking at it from a purely nostalgic yeah, there's a, point it's, of view. Because Dobbs Ferry is the, is the only place that I see in my head when I when listen you, to this album. Okay. No other, no other place. Yeah. I mean, it's got just so many memories attached to it, you know, just. Yeah. And, and know. it's, it's funny, like I said, like the, like they're so thought of in the eighties, you know, because, yeah. you know, heart, their second to last album, heartbeat city was like gigantic. Oh yeah. Like that At that point like a, they were, they were the pinnacle like fully in on the, on the MTV thing. Yeah. The very visual Pro- produced, band pr- produced by your boy, Mutt Lang. Yeah. The, 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 not- the production <laughs> values were much, much higher. Um, yeah. So, much to their yeah. chagrin. They were not ha- like they, they wanted Mutt Lang and then, and it's kind of like, be careful what you wish for. You might get it Yeah, because he's <laughs> yeah. a perfectionist. They were used to yeah. kind of working kind of quickly and that well, like with Roy Thomas Baker, it's kind of like, okay, we kind of do this. We get it done. Right. Uh, but with Mutt Lang on heartbeat, heart, heartbeat, heartbeat city, uh, he's a perfectionist. Like you're not singing the vowel correctly. Like you need to redo like that. To, you know, that's the type of precise uh, production that he provides. And, and you hear that with Def Leppard, everything sounds as much as you hate that sound and it shows it sounds yeah. perfect. It's, it's, it's a self-contained thing, you know? Right. Um, this was before, this was well before that, but, but this was still, this actually still this, their debut album still outsold heartbeat city. Uh, that sold, that went four times platinum and this went six. Yeah. So it's still, still an amazing thing. Now you, you hit on, on new wave. So the cars were formed in 1976 uh, Rick Ocasek and Benjamin Orr were, were kind of in bands before this to get together. So they kind of were the nucleus of, of the cars. And then the, you know, I think Elliot Easton came on and then they, they kind of rounded everybody out. So, um, the term new wave, right. I was, I was thinking about it. Cause when you, when you think of the cars, that's the only term you could think of. That's the Absolutely. only, like, yeah, you know, you probably could ascribe other things to him, but when you, when you, you say someone to the, when you say someone uh, to someone, what is what what is the car's music? Yeah, what genre are they? New right. wave, new wave. Yeah, right? and you and you no... and you hit on that with Gary Newman. They wear oh. that badge very well. I mean, they're, they're, they could be the poster. <laughs> that, that's, know, what it, get, that's what I was getting. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, <laughs> is is in seventy eight. That that that's when this was was kind of starting. Right, there was you know, new wave was kind of uh, punk punk music with the pop sensibilities kind of merged, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and it was kind of uh, snubbing their nose as, you know, this type of music at, at the, at the progressive rock and, and that big and the corporate rock that, you know, of, of like that sticks That's... was accused of that kind of overblown <laughs> yeah. stuff where it's kind of, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really catchy. It's bouncy. Um, and it's, and it's very listenable, but it's got those, those kind of those interesting edges. And, um, in 78, I, I wanted to pull this up. You know, I think, I think we could, we should, we haven't done this in a while, but talk about some of the albums that were out in 78. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll see that there's kind of two, there's two things going on here. Um, in 78, you had some girls by the Rolling Stones. Um, you had darkness on the edge of town by the, by the boss, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, you had stranger in town by Bob Seger, mm. right? You had 52nd street by Billy Joel. Um, you had Who Are You 
by the who? Yeah, double vision by foreigner. Yeah. Pieces of eight. <coughs> pieces of eight yeah. by sticks. Um, but seriously, folks, by Joe Walsh, right? So and and well, jazz by Queen. So we'll stop there. And Boston, don't look back, their second album. Mm-hmm. Then you had this year's model by Elvis Costello. Parallel lines by Blondie. Bl- Blondie, yeah. Uh, more songs about buildings and food by Talking Heads. Question, are we not men? Answer, we are Devo. Yeah. Are Devo in 1978. <laughs> wow. Um, give them enough <laughs> rope by The Clash. So you see what's happening here. There's like, there's some some definitive things happening where there's still a, a the 70s rock, you know, Heaven Tonight by Cheap Trick. So there was that, that whole Rod Stewart, Blondes Have More Fun. The whole 70s rock thing was still alive and well. Yeah. But then there was this other thing happening. You know, especially when you have stuff like Blondie and and Devo and Talking Heads, right? And then the and then the Cars, this whole new like well, <laughs> the term new wave I guess could apply here in this year. I mean, some of the and, and those were the more preferred albums for sure. Yeah, L- literally you know? a new wave of yeah. music was happening where yeah. you know, and I almost looked at it. You know that that D- you know Devo and Talking Heads both had albums in 78 and then the Cars first mm-hmm. album was in 78. I kind of look at the Cars as almost like splitting the difference between the weirdness of Devo and the the quirkiness of the Talking Heads and I think the Cars kind of fit like are are the ones that you could listen to that you kind of you know they kind of split the difference between both like the like the uh, Devo stuff was kind of way out there. They could be you know, very, very, yeah, they're very the most accessible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Very, you know, Devo, very, you know, kind of quirky, electronic and very avant garde. And then the talking heads were more accessible, but still kind of off putting, like still not not off putting in a bad way. But it was kind of like, you know, right. Like you kind of, you know, the music made you work for it. And then more experimental. Yeah. At that point, kind of right there. Um, You often mentioned that it takes a couple of albums for somebody to kind of, you know, to put out that one gem. Mm-hmm. of a record and 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 boy that they 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 already did it with this record you know, they just, do you I mean, have it, my note do you have my notes no <laughs> i don't <laughs> am i picking in my you're, you're literally you're literally right like right you're like going from my notes you know i i, I wrote one of the that's, things i wrote that's hilarious yeah i wrote um, that the band emerged fully formed yeah and that no no evolution was needed so you you hit the nail oh. right on the head there there wasn't a run-up like Billy Joel, where he was kind of plodding along and he's like, that's right. Yeah. Play yeah. Guy, and, they, and they're ready to drop him and they're like, you know, get your act together. And then he starts hitting his stride or, or these other bands where, yeah, they kind of, you know, they kind of have those, those three or four albums where they're just kind of figuring things out and then they have the one. Right. This album, there's nine songs on this album. Six of, six of them are certified, like, like either chart hits or FM radio staples. Right. That's it. Like, Again, for an like like I said, for an album from a, from a debut artist like this, mm-hmm. I didn't even realize it. I was like, this all this is on here. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, like it, it's, it, 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 well, it didn't hurt either too that they were the dar- darlings of Boston. Apparently, yeah. the the r- local radio station in Boston would play the demos yeah. of, of a lot of these songs uh, before they polished them up. You know, so they already got some. I guess a, a following, you know, happened. Yeah, they had some of those. Like, dis- you know, there was, yeah, there was, was some, you know, very favorable reviews. You know, critics jockeys, started yeah, champ- championing yep. them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that that certainly didn't uh, hurt them uh, out the gate. So yeah, I mean, there's something to the band. I guess it's a it's a testament to them and the songwriting and and what they wanted from the get go. You know, it wasn't something that they they necessarily led up to. Um, and work and had to, well, this doesn't work. Let's try this kind of thing. It doesn't feel like that at all. Yeah, they, it feels weren't, like, they you know, weren't like grasping, I think. Yeah, they weren't trying right. to like, yeah. uh, oh, they're trying to do this and it didn't work. Or mm-hmm. their, their sound was it was uniquely their own and something totally different. Yeah. The sound of the cars is the sound of the car. There's not a, a, as poppy as they are. And, yeah. you know, there's they also have this unique combination, of, which is different than, you know, their You've got the the uh, we've got the American New Wave, and then you've got the British New Wave, and I think we said this. I think we said this with the Blondie episode too. Mm-hmm. Like the American New Wave music, and these those artists seem to skewed, seem to still embrace the guitar w- with the keyboard. 
Whereas yes. the British, uh, you know, this and this is a broad generalization. Elvis Costello, you could say, oh, well, it's not true. Um, uh, broadly speaking, by the time we got to the 80s, too, there, there was, you know, in, in the British, the new British invasion, there was more of an embracing of the of the electronics and the technical the yeah, keyboards, the synths, the synths, bands. Yep. all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Where, whereas the cars kind of, there's those rock elements that kind of grab and say, oh, wow, this is like a rock song. But then but then they they have those keyboards woven in. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes it sound so, like something different. It doesn't sound Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers have the same, virtually the same, the same kind of setup of, of a band. Right. And they have a keyboard player, mm -hmm. but they, these bands do not sound alike, but they no. have the same exact keyboard. They have the same exact setup sticks. Like I said earlier, has the same exact setup with keyboard, you know, the same amount of members and the same setup, but the bands doesn't mean that they're going to sound alike. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're approaching it in a different way. And, and the car and this album is just so dynamic from just as soon as it starts. Yeah. You I know? wonder, I wonder like in, during those days when things were changing so rapidly and so, uh, radically, um, and the punk moving kind of sort of like really, you know, kind of came and went and then this new wave stuff started happening. Well, you know, the rawness of that starts to slide away and now we want to embrace technology and, and all this stuff. And I wonder if it's regional. I wonder if like in the United States, you know, depending on where you're from, who was experimenting more with this stuff, like on the New York scene, Boston, mm -hmm. like the East, you know, East coast kind of sound. Of course the West coast was still pretty much stuck in the, in hippie land, <laughs> you know, there was, you know, very sunny, still, you know, still putting out that very, like, there's a lot yeah, of great still acoustic the California, music. The California sound was still, still happening at this point. So yeah, I, I think it, it'd be interesting to kind of chart that, to, you know, to, to take a yeah, look well, at that. Well, talk, like, talking heads were from New York. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So we, we mm -hmm. know that. And, and you, like you said, these guys were from, from Boston. Blondie is, is certainly a New York band as well. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to throw Lou Reed into the mix uh, outside of Velvet Underground and what he was kind of right. doing in the 70s is square, squarely, certainly New York based. Um, yeah. So I would say, but, you know, you could probably easily split the, the country in half and say, you know, from the, you know, from the you know, middle of the country east was mm -hmm. probably that that grittier new wave sound, because by the time, you know, when. When it got to California, you had stuff like the motels which was kind of smoother. You know, the production was a little bit kind of smoother. They still used a lot of those, you know, they still had all those elements of new wave. Yeah. Um, but like I said, but yeah, there was still, they, there was that California sound influence mm -hmm. put on there, like scandal, like goodbye to you. Like that certainly sounds like a West coast kind of very version. LA, very LA yeah, a, a West coast yeah. version of, of new wave. So yeah, mm -hmm. you, you make a really good point that yeah ju and just i'm sure parts of england and, and and other parts of europe it was certainly more yeah. regional i'm sure like fat what, what falco was doing was very kind of more <laughs> more electronic right more programming yeah. and stuff like that so yeah there you have those enclaves of 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 whatever the musical scene was yeah in that area then adapt then new wave kind of adapting from it so whatever the new york punk scene might have been um, th that's what you kind of, th that's the melting pot and the new wave kind of rises from that, you know, right. and they throw the, the police are thrown in kind of, in, oh, of in, course. That, in that conversation as well of, of taking those, those punk elements, some progressive Wanting, elements, and then putting yeah. it in, in that pop rapper. So they certainly are part of the conversation for new. Yeah. Wave well. Always like we've always talked, like I mentioned it several times and of starting out as a, you know, we wanted to be just, you know, just punk and, you know, but that's like, you know, there's only so much you can do when your ambition you know, takes hold and you want to start doing more in the music, you know, punk rock is like the Ramones and you know, the sex pistols are playing basically three, four chords. Yeah. Every song is pretty much the same thing. They, it's, they, it's they the, made a career out of it. It's the attitude. It's, it's the, <laughs> That's what it it's is. the anti, yeah. we, we suck and we know it. The attitude is what I, it's what is punk rock to me. It's like, we're, yeah. we don't have to be great musicians. Uh, but a lot of these bands had, talented people in them and you know wherever back whatever background they came from some of them maybe classically trained perhaps or or you know they just off i mean like you look at rico Kasich, and he is not your typical lead singer like you mentioned yeah. he's very sort of i would say he's very eccentric you know yeah. the, just, just sort of like ironic you know, he's got that sort of like cool it's attitude a, yeah like, detached very detached yes yes it's yeah. just very very and, and and it works it works yeah. for this particular 
they're, yeah, they're, and, and he, he would actually, band. yeah, yeah, he would actually say because he wrote a lot of the songs and a lot of the hits, he would actually say, if I want a a a, a beautiful voice or this song needs to be sung right, we give it yeah. to Ben, we give it to Benjamin. Yeah, because he had and, the and, right, because he had that he had those vocal chops, and Rick Ocasek would lean into that quirky, stilted, uh, detached <laughs> vocal style, like like because yes. he knew that was. That was what he was good at. So, so they had you had that. You had like someone that can kind of do the straight ahead, kind of more rockier things. But yeah. when it got to the quirky and the strange things, right? Like you had you had someone there that was already that was kind of tailor made visually and vocally for it, and and he right. kind of leaned into it. That nervous, you know, that nervous quiver in his in his voice, and that kind of <laughs> yeah, you know, like like yeah. you know. That that almost uh, almost seems like he's an uncomfortable person in his own skin, and, and the cars, you know, it's it was, it, it's a great it's a great it's, it's, it's great tools to have because you can you can kind of like like on this album, you've got mm-hmm. the straight ahead stuff like "Good Times Roll," "My Best Friend's Girl," just what I needed, Jesus, you know. Mm-hmm. But then right after those three, those are those are the first three songs on the album: "Good Times Roll," "My Best Friend's Girl," just what I needed. But then right after that, you get a song called "I'm in Touch with Your World," which is squarely the new wavy stuff. It's that, yep. you know, that, that kind of strangey stuff that you think <laughs> of when you think of new wave music, yep. you know, so, so, and it's, and it's, and Rick, Rick Ocasek has the lead on it, you know? So, um, God, it, it's just, you know, that, that's probably what's so great about this album is uh-huh. six, six songs that are just bangers. Bye Bye Love is one of my favorite, like, yeah. car songs of all time. Yep. You know, moving in and, stereo, of course, is yeah. was made popular with, from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Yeah, and, and that's a new wave scene. anthem. <laughs> we all know the anthem. scene. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not even on the soundtrack. Funnily enough, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit, it's like the probably the most remembered scene in the film, and it, yet it's not on the soundtrack. That blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're not gonna, you're I'm, not going to say you're not going to say what the scene is for for those that have of never course, seen. Of course, uh, well, the Phoebe Kate scene well, of the, of course, okay. the pool. Judge, Judge Reinhold in the bathroom. <laughs> we'll uh, leave it there. A, <laughs> <his> little... <laughs> it's fantasy scene. We'll leave it at that. Well, that's right. That's, and that's, that's the thing about it this was. album was like in 78, it was great. And yeah. then in 82, it was great even more. It and was, then it yeah, like, it was ahead of its time. And then it would reoccur later on in the 80s for me. Yeah. Like, I remember our friend Johnny, you know, we're, we're, we're cruising in the LTD, man. Like he's, he's, he loved the car. So he's blasting yeah. this record. And yeah, you know, it just, it has that staying power to it you know that just can you know and you don't i would argue you, that you, prob- you, you probably don't even need the rest of their catalog it, 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 i don't know i mean that's yeah. just me but i i definitely think this is the strongest well, they, they, you know they, they, you know they had their kind of ups and downs their, their follow-up yeah. was was candio which did really well i mean mm-hmm. candio had a lot of hits on it and then they put out an album called panorama which had nothing it was weird had like mm-hmm. kind of ran dry it was like there was nothing on there. I was because I went through. I'm kind of listening. I'm like, wow, if this this has a lot of the car stuff that I know. What do these other albums have? You know, and then after yeah. after Panorama uh, was Shake It Up, which kind of brought them back. Shake It Up was is squarely an eighties, <laughs> yeah, eighties feeling. It's like that's like a Friday yeah. night cruising song. Yeah. Um, and then after that, Heartbeat City came came out, and then they had one more album after that when when they kind of kind of flamed out, but. So I think it was what seven, I think seven albums mm-hmm. um, that they had. So not not a not a bad uh, discography, uh, and and they were able to have a real clunker in the middle with Panorama and actually and, and dig their way out of it. And then Heartbeat City, like I said, yeah. had Magic, uh, Drive. I love Drive. Uh, Hello yeah. again, which is a cork, you know, yeah. quirky song. You know, so they were really kind of leaning into it, but. Um, a lot, a lot of bands will have that clunker in the middle and, and that usually will sink their career. So, um, it, it didn't hurt that Electra, they, they, they ended up signing to Electra records who, who had like the doors back in the, back in the sixties. Yeah. Uh, I think Eagles were on the Electra subsidiary, subsidiary of Warners. I'm not sure, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. a lot of those types of bands and, and Electra, uh, didn't have any new wave groups on their label. And they kind they were kind of like, well, we, you know, what's missing from this picture? So, so the cars actually had a couple of labels interested in them and they ended up going with Electra because they felt like, like they were going to get the attention that they needed because they were like one of the few, if not the only. Yeah. There was too many bands. To act. On- mm-hmm. Yeah. When you've got, you know, when you've got a band, when you've got a label that's scooping them all up, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, some are going to get lost in the shuffle. So they went with Electra because it was no, it was virtually a wasteland. They hadn't really kind of leaned into it yet. 
Um, right. So they were able to really get that promotion of wow, we're the we're the we're the new wave band on Electra. So that was kind of a Ar- Arista was the uh, Ar- was yeah the, Arista was the other Ar- one. Yeah. Arista was the was yep. the other label which had many acts yeah you know on it and yeah I mean it definitely it, and again it's like this is this would we be talking about this today like record you know this is, this is such a weird time uh, that a record label could make or break a band or, yeah. or make them more popular because people do people know late record labels back in the day I mean I, I guess so you know that's the thing it's like you know if, I, you, I don't if, know. if you're I, a music I, lover or a critic or 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 DJ if you if you know who's doing what you know so it's like oh that, that well that we're on that label so we got some yeah we well, got some seems, recognition you know like well, Atlantic like the- or you know it seemed like from a, a business standpoint that Electra was was actively interested in that as well, saying, "Wow, there's yeah. there's an opportunity that we don't want to miss here, and and we have a glaring omission. We don't have any of this type of music. We don't have any of these types of artists. So yeah, that's a we need to kind of get on it, you know. Good call, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really was, you know, much much like much like Electra when when they signed the Doors back in the sixties was it was the same thing. They yeah, I think it was Jack Holzman, I think, or, or who signed them, and he they hadn't seen anything like the Doors. And like, this is very different. We need to kind of, kind of get on it, you know. And and as a subsidiary of Warner's, you're still kind of under the big umbrella, um, but you've got that small label, so they were able to give them that attention. So, uh, yeah, the the cars absolutely benefited from being the fir- being one of the early bands in the new wave scene, but then also having a label. Because we've we've had conversations about that where the label just is, isn't interested, doesn't promote it, like we like we did Men at Work. Yeah, you know CBS uh, USA was not interested in this Australian band, and it took it took like three or four asks for mm-hmm. them to finally put it out. Right, so if you've got a label that's disinterested, you're kind of sunk, despite your yeah. best efforts. You you know that ultimately your fate is in someone else's hands. So right, uh, this was a good thing with Electra that they really kind of embraced it you know really kind of gave it a push and it was very you know like i said the the sound is just uh I, you know i wrote down the godfathers of new wave perhaps yeah that's a that's a fair you statement know, again just on, on this one six million out out the door um if you haven't heard this album i think i think people i think people take the cars <laughs> for granted almost kind of like Hall and oats it's like oh you know they have so many yeah. great, you know, Hall and Oates, oh, they have so many hits in the eight, you know, ah, uh, you know, kind of that thing. People are gonna um, go right for the greatest hits. Package. Yeah, because that's <laughs> you know, this album yeah. pretty much has it, but it's got but it's got a little more on there. And and it's yeah. good, it, it's it's good to listen to for the fact, like you said, that this this is a band that kind of came out of the womb, like fully formed. Right. Like this is it. This was their debut. There wasn't any EPs, it was just the demos that they were working up. And then here's the album. Yeah, to and have that confidence and that vision that you know exactly what you want and what to do. Um, yeah, or just to be that good with the material, like they didn't have to. Yeah. Well, you know what I, what I find too is I, I, we we need to mention Roy Thomas Baker here, who yep. who was famous for working with Queen. Yeah, he worked with a lot on of their artists. first uh, five five albums. Yep. Ironically enough, it, it, when they when the, when there's a, when the when the backing vocals kick in in a lot of these songs, it reminds me of Queen. Right. And, and Queen, a little bit. Now like, that you mentioned the it. game, yeah. right? The game. Now, Roy Thomas Baker did not produce the game, though, that, which is, I find very, very funny. Like, it's just, you know, they, Queen made that jump and they made it into that new wave type of sound. Yeah. They started, started working in, with Mac, with Mac, with the synthesizers and yeah. all that. And it, I think, it, I just think it's funny that he was already establishing a new wave sound, this guy. And, and it's funny yeah. that he just didn't continue with Queen to do that. I wonder why, you know, like yeah, that, was... that might have been a queen decision. Queen might have been looking to say, yeah. well, we need to, you know, we want to change our sound and we're evolving. So he represents, mm-hmm. you know, just like, just like Tom Petty with Jimmy Iovine. It's like, you know, okay, we're going to, we want to do something different. So we need to, you're nothing against you, but yeah, you know, we need, we need to start using someone different just to change things up, you know? Right. And, 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 and yeah, for all intents and purposes, queen ended up probably where they might've anyway. Uh, yeah. But who knows? Maybe they just needed, you know, they needed some some fresh fresh ideas, and and it helped. It, it benefited the cars, uh, certainly. Because yeah, Roy Thomas Baker. Not a lot of people know about him, but uh, for, formidable producer. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. like you said, he's uh, no joke. I mean, big big stuff in the uh, in the seventies. You know, uh, 
like you said, all the Queen stuff, uh, Ian Hunter, Pilot, John Anderson, Jolyn Turner. Uh, he did Motley Crue in the early 80s. Um, mm. So a lot of, you know, he did, uh, he worked with Journey on Infinity and Evolution. Um, That's so right. yeah, he's, yeah. yeah, so he's, he's kind of, you know, he's kind of like one of those guys in the seventies that you would grab, not a particular style, but able to get, kind of get the job done. You know, like, like I said, not like a Mutt Lang who's got a sound and you can kind of be kind of almost pick it out. So, um, yeah, I think it worked. It worked for the cars. Um, I think having that, having, having an experienced producer kind of helped with them also. Again, you're talking mm -hmm. a debut album, a brand new group. This guy's worked with Queen. He's, he's, you know, already a, a, a big kind of a big deal, you know, kind of like Glenn Johns with, with the, with the Eagles, right. Same type mm -hmm. of thing. It's like you, you get you, if you get someone to kind of champion your cause and work with you, that that's yeah. icing on the cake, right? Cause then you, then all mm -hmm. you gotta do is you bring your material in and you've got a professional like, like this guy that can really shape it and give it. And especially if, if you're on the new horizon of this new sound, uh, mm -hmm. and if everybody's on the same page, this is, this is what you get. You got a debut album like this is probably, probably, uh, probably one of the greatest debut albums. Oh, definitely. And I, right. and I'm sure at some point we'll probably do a top five. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that on the horizon. Well, well, debut, well the, you know, the top album. five would be more subjective. It, it would be what we enjoy, but if you're, if you're going, if you're kind of going pound for pound and you're going chart, chart activity yeah. and all that stuff there, you know, this is it. Like you can't, I don't think you, you can't really count Nirvana because they had an album out before it was on a smaller label, but it wasn't their debut. It was their major label debut. Right. That's right. This was their mm -hmm. debut, you know, guns and roses. I, I don't think they, you know, I think that was their, their, you know, I think use your illusion. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Appetite for destruction was their debut. I don't think they were on a smaller label. So, you know, yeah, they might, ha they might have to go into the ring with, with, you know, Appetite for destruction. That could, well, that could be a tough one, but Boston, Boston, Say you know, yeah. Boston's another one. Yep. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of heavy hitters, but these guys are you know, and these guys are kind of like the the dark horse, I think. Um, cause I don't think people realized how many the the amount of hits only because they had songs throughout their career from seventy eight to you know what is what Heartbeat City was like eighty five, eighty four yeah. around there somewhere around so there eighty four eighty five um, yeah. So it's easy to to assume that they're kind of peppered throughout. Um, when when not the case six, six of that's those not, hits not, are on this album no <laughs> that's right there's, there's other stuff i mean we're, we're kind of we're kind of shortchanging like their their other hits but um but not really i mean it's kind of like um there there's their greatest i mean i, I didn't i didn't bother look looking up their greatest hits you know I, I didn't even bother to do that but you know like on on candio right the hits were let's go mm -hmm. Uh, it's all I can do. Um, the, the song Candy O and Dangerous Type. So that's like four. Mm -hmm. Panorama had nothing. It had like a song called Touch and Go, I think, which was like Zip. Uh, the, the album Shake yeah. It Up had Since You're Gone and, and Shake It Up. Right. And then after that was mm -hmm. Heartbeat City, which was Hello Again, Magic Drive. You might think. Um, and then I think Heartbeat City was a, was a minor one. And then Door to Door was there final one of the eighties before they broke up, which was just the song. You are the girl, which was kind of, yeah. You know, um, and then that and was that's it. when they just started doing solo projects and yeah, that's basically when they broke it, up. Know. I think they, you know, they, they reformed in 2011, obviously with, without Benjamin orcs, he had already passed away and they, they did an album after yeah. that. So, you know, a, squarely a, a creature of the, of the late seventies and of the eighties. Um, like I said, probably, like we said with men at work or, and some of the other ones probably better left there, you know, mm -hmm. what would they have, what would a nineties cars have sounded like? Eh, not sure. I don't think they would have even not sure. I don't think they probably wouldn't have even, uh, dared to compete with what was happening in the nineties. Yeah. You know, it was, it was tough. It was so. tough enough in the eighties. And then Rick, Rick Ocasek became yeah. a, a label guy. Anyway, he started working and he actually started producing, he produced, uh, started producing music. I think we talked about him in, uh, just one of the episodes recently where he was working with, uh, with, with the band and they wanted to, they didn't want to do mm -hmm. a song. And he decided he told him to do, Oh, it was, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, our top five alternative. He was producing, uh, okay. buddy, Ho yes. buddy Holly for Weezer. 
Rico Kasich. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And they didn't. And they didn't. He, you know, Rivers Cuomo, the writer of of Buddy Holly, was like, yeah, I don't want to. I don't think it's a good song. Rico Kasich was like, just record it. You know, record it anyway. You don't have to use it. No harm, no foul. Let's, let's do it. So, so yeah, mm-hmm. he still continued in the music business. He ended up marrying Paulina Porskova, who's the girl from the Drive video um, model, right. very yeah. very famous uh, relationship there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they they would divorce. I think they divorced like not long before he passed away, and he didn't leave her anything. Yeah. He cut yeah. her out. <laughs> not a nice thing to do. Speaking. Of- Speaking of which, uh, okay. uh, models, let's <laughs> let's talk about the cover of the record. Um, yeah, they hated it. That they, they, yeah, they didn't like it, right? Yeah, yeah. I always, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of it myself, to be honest. I, I, I just, it is very it's okay. It kind of set the tone. It, it was, yeah, it kind of like, all right, you know. Um, yeah. They apparently, they apparently had an album cover already done. I think the the uh, the keyboardist uh, had kind of yeah. made one. He said we spent like eighty bucks on it, and we. It was a collage and, the, and you know, the label's like, nah, we don't want it. And they ended up using a version of it on, on the inside, on the inside sleeve. Mm-hmm. They had to take some of the images out because it was problematic, I guess. But, uh, but that kind of set the tone of the car. So it's a woman in a car. And that kind of set, also set the tone of having these, uh, having women on the, on the album covers, except for Panorama, covers. you know? So, mm-hmm. you know, Candy O is a sketch of a woman and then uh, Shake It Up. Obviously, has a woman on the front, and Heartbeat City has a woman on there. So that kind of became yeah. like a you know the cars and the women kind of became like their their image. Although they're not that type of a band, but just it just became associated with it for some reason. That was not not yeah. not by their doing, but it's still it's still an iconic thing now. Like it's kind of like when you think of the cars, you think of those album covers, and they have it's. You know, they're not sexist. They just have women. Well, perhaps on them. they're just promoting the cruising thing, which we did. I mean, we cruised to this music in the eighties. I mean, yeah, this, nice. this was Absolutely. classic. This is like classic Friday. This is, kind of this Friday is Friday night, Friday, rolling Friday the windows Saturday, down. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Friday and Saturday night right? albums. That's <laughs> yep. it. Cru- cruising around. And, and if you don't, if you're not listening to this or stuff like shake it up or, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, let's go. Um, mm-hmm. the cars were made for that kind of like nighttime partying, uh, being out, having that kind of music on in the background. You, you know, we talk about the soundtrack of our lives and, and that's kind of where the cars fit into that is, um, yep. they're kind of always there. Like I said, you're always kind of, kind of cranking out the hits and the music and staying, staying in step as, as the eighties progressed. And as that music got more a uh, kind of electronic and keyboard heavy, they kind of followed suit you know heartbeat city is very kind of synth heavy and really leans into it and that's mm-hmm. that's why it did so well because right in at that point in the 80s that's what that music was you know yeah. so if you listen to like there's nothing song, but <laughs> yeah if you listen to that song drive it's like all it's all keyboards and synth it's know? all keyboard the electronic yeah, drums the yeah it's know, all whole, programming whole it's all sequencing. i love the song yeah, I love the mood i love what it has to say you know but um but yeah you know that was they lost that kind of like, uh, you know, that guitar edge that yeah. this first album. Well, I had, think they were leaning that, into. It. I think cling, that you know, leaning, I, you know, clinging to that, you know, uh, slightly punk sound. It, or, it's probably a good rock, thing they didn't. You know, you know, I, I think that was their. Yeah. I think that was their probably their winning formula coming out of Panorama, which had nothing on it. It's kind of like okay, you know, we we still it's still a natural. Need, we can still be the car. Yeah, we can yeah. still be the cars. And, and and their stuff is uniquely theirs. Uh, but when you get to heart, yeah, mm-hmm. when you get to Heartbeat City, does it resemble this? No. You know, this is mm. very much guitar based first, with keyboards enhancing it. You know, by the time you yeah. get to the end of their career, and like, I kind of like that, and I kind of like the separation there. You know, like I kind of like the way it. Each person is doing their own thing, kind of. You know, it definitely yeah. feels more of a band effort. You could argue yeah. that something like Heartbeat City might be just three guys you you don't really know because yeah. there's so much electronic stuff happening one person could be doing that you don't you know what i mean like how do you really yeah. know who's playing who's what? doing what yeah. you know that kind of that's right yeah, you got you got a song on this album like just what i needed which has that balance of the yeah. guitar and then it's got it's got some nice keyboard flourishes it's got a, it's got mainly got a keyboard solo in it um mm-hmm. so yeah the, you know that that's what the new wave was was kind of bat was adapting 
the rock music and the punk aesthetics. And and these guys, I think the keyboardist here, uh, is his name, is it Greg Hawks? The, uh, Greg, Greg Hawks, Hawks yeah. is the keyboardist, Hawks saxophone keyboardist. player. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. he said he, he was notorious for whatever toy came out, they would buy it. Even if they used it for a month, like whatever new yeah. technology was coming out. And I, I was watching one, uh, I was watching one of their live videos on, on YouTube today and there's a Fairlight mm-hmm. computer on, on stage with them, which was, yeah. you know, the Fairlight was cutting edge <laughs> technology and not easy to use. And they had the Fairlight on, on stage with them, which is basically a computer screen with Sam, you know, early types of sampling. So uh, they said and anything that was new, we were all about, we were all about just listen, trying things. Even if it was junk, we would just get it and ch- just to check it out. So we can kind of, yeah. Uh, expose ourselves to new sound, new sounds, new ways of making sounds. You know, and I think that's what made the cars unique. Also, is that they weren't so, uh, so like a, like a horse with blinders on. Of, of we gotta you know, stay this course. The kind of like no, let's you know we're we're always going to be open to new things. And it's, it was still the cars, like you said. It was still mm-hmm. it's still in the end still sounded like the cars, which is a great. Yeah. Should we should we should yeah. we bother doing? Favorite songs? Favorite favorite songs? <laughs> I don't I don't know. I mean, it's, the whole thing. The whole thing. The whole thing. Why not? It's it's a great <laughs> listen. It's an easy listen. It's, it it kind of reminds me of New World Record in that sense, where it's the you know the perfect length. Mm-hmm. Um, you just put it on and you just breeze right through it, and it, it's an enjoyable listen. And for me, like I said, it's very nostalgic. I, I remember just a very specific time frame. Yeah. Of this album, and those and those are some of my very favorite times. You know, those years, seventy eight to like eighty two, eighty three. You know, like in that in that stretch right there, I had some really great music, great yeah. movies. Um, yeah, I'll always cherish those. those yeah, it was it was exciting. Years, it was know? exciting to kind of you didn't realize it at the time, but when you look back on it now, you're right. like, wow, we were we were kind of in the middle of of one of those musical up, up churnings. I mean, we were there for a couple of them, you know, with grunge and everything, but this yeah, was, I just, you know, when you're younger, it just be, kind of becomes, you know, you're still open to listening to everything. So all this stuff is just coming at you, you know, and you're kind of, right. and then you realize, wow, this was like new wave. And I was kind of listening to that. And, uh, I didn't realize it was all this other stuff going, you know, then the, you know, like I said, like Blondie and the police and, you, you mm-hmm. might think of now, you know, at the time you probably think of them as separate, like, oh, I like, I like Heart of Glass or I like this song one way or another. And then, oh, I like, you know, Don't Stand So Close to Me by the Police. But you don't realize that this is actually all like a, a wellspring of, of a new genre that's kind of coming from, yeah. from something specific. But it, when you're younger, you just kind of like, they're, they're in different areas, you just kind of like it because it's, it's, it's good music, but not like, oh, this is this genre. It's like, no, it's just. Oh, there's this band, the police. Oh, there's this band, you know, this one. And, and that, oh, there's, and it, band, the you know, car. the 80s would do that though. It would play it to yeah. excess and there would be, you know, everybody kind of just, it was just so much of it that it kind of canceled it, the whole thing out. You know, there really wasn't any, like by the end of the 80s, it was not a whole hell of a lot going on as far as, yeah, like, they were done. It was exhausted. Yeah. You know, and you had, you had a lot of R&B groups now yeah. using electronic equipment, right? Like, you know, the, the the sort of one hit wonders of the you know Whitney Houston Co- on the scene and the pop color artists me, like, color you know. me bad <laughs> yeah you know so there wasn't you know like that late eighties lull there was just not yeah. for me I guess that's probably why maybe that's what I'm thinking of when I'm like when I tend to be critical yeah uh, of the eighties at large I'm probably not being fair is uh, you know we're 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 here we are and we're just sort of reminiscing about the early stuff and it's just, it's great it's great stuff yeah, and it, 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 yeah I, I get this too- like warm feeling when I listen to this stuff and that you know not there aren't a lot of years that do that you know like when you get when you get older there's some great albums for sure though those are easy to just sort of you know cherry picking off the tree what some of the great stuff was like you know when when you're adult you know that kind of thing but back in those days it was just I just enjoyed the entire, yeah, I, you know, I, I think you can, uh, you know, I think you can, you can almost use the cars as an example of that. Right. Is, you know, you said by, by yeah. the end of the eighties, you got kind of got tired because, because that yeah. style of music had hit a critical mass. Like you said, all, you know, everybody was doing it and the car, you know, the cars were kind of the, the evolution by the time they got to heartbeat city and, and their last album, it was the same type of thing. Like they, I think they had probably mm-hmm. taken that, 
idea of the cars as far as it was going to go. Like they had exhausted, there really wasn't any other pivoting they were going to do because, because they were so popular in the eighties and kind of continued to evolve with it. They weren't going mm -hmm. to evolve into grunge. It was never going to happen. They weren't going to evolve into hair metal. So they kind of rode, kind of rode the train to the destination, just like at the end of the eighties where, you know, all those, ba you know, those bands just, well, most of them didn't survive because it was just kind of, the yeah. excess, the excess, the excess. Let's kind of keep developing the sound, and then no one wanted to hear that sound anymore. You know, and then right. that's where that's why yeah. what happened in the nineties happened in the nineties because people were just like, I, I can't take the shoulder pads, I can't take the the Cavarici suits, I can't, you know, like all that, like all that right. stuff, kind of like literally yeah. got like wiped, like literally got wiped clean in the night, like like in, by by the early nineties, all that stuff was kind of wiped clean and done, and no one it didn't even like hold. It wasn't even a holdover. It was like that stuff, the fashions, the type of music, yeah. all that stuff was gone. The colors, yeah, it was it was just gone. Yeah. It was there. Everybody even MTV wore to was not the same. Yeah, which yeah, MTV, I I kind of you could you could argue. I mean, you could blame MTV in a way, you know, for just <laughs> it's their uh, fault. Well, the visual, like, you know, people were like leaning into the visual aspect of the Yeah, music. The, the more and, splashy and, you know, or the more, bands, yeah, the more brighter, the, the better. The bands yeah. were, right, you know, and that was a, a big hook. Um, yeah. But even, like, by the time you got to the 90s, MTV kind of lost that, that you know. The well, they were, they were leaning pulse. into the grunge, too, and they were leaning into the alternative thing. Right. They were leaning into that, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the baggy, the cargo pants and the flannels. Um, they, they were as <laughs> yeah. much, as much, you know, kind of spearheading those changes as they were following them and, and, and pushing them forward and, and kind of getting it out there. So, um, uh, yeah, the cars absolutely checked it. This album's out on Spotify. I, I didn't see any special editions, but even if there was, I, I don't want one. Um, there is a rhino edition. Yeah. I just need these, I just a, need these nine songs. It's a brand new remix. Yeah. yeah. Who needs it? Yeah. You want right. the original, like, <laughs> like, like get, like get, get the, you know, this is one of those ones advocate for like, this is the original intent of the band. These nine songs was what their statement was. Anything outside of that was okay. Um, not part of, of what this magical thing that happened in 1978 was. And we didn't even mention out of the blue 1978. See, I haven't had the bell in a long out. time. Yeah, but that came out in 77. 77 that's why. <laughs> The but end of charting. 77. It was still to be charts, fair, yeah. but it was still, it was, it was still, me, charting. yeah, right. There you go. Um, <laughs> it was still charting and still going strong, but, the, but again, those were like the last gasps of that whole type of genre of music. So, um, yeah, it, it's it, listen to this one. That's all we're going to say. Much like men at work. I think this is another debut and it's interesting that we've done two music episodes, uh, in a row or, or close to each other that are debuts, uh, and mm -hmm. both fantastic yeah. debuts. You know, both virtually unknown bands, both with a with a, a treasure trove of music in it, um, and then both and both of this one though is six out of nine. You, you're not going to get better than that. It, 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 it's it, this is an yeah. easy listen. Like I said, the first three out of the gate, it's like you're you're ready. We put this on on a Friday or Saturday night. You're done. Get in your car. Get in if, your car. Put you this on it, and drive around. It. If you know it and know it well, you know what we're talking about, yeah. right? Um, but if you don't know it, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you don't, this is this is an opportunity yeah. to check out like the the really the the seedlings of what new wave and what what would come in the eighties. This is kind of the, the you know the, this album and 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 parallel lines are kind of like the seedlings of of that thing. You know, and we'll probably get to a Talking Heads album as well, which would be the same type mm. of thing. You know, um, but yeah. I, I, anything in closing about the cars? I think we've can we shut the door. I think, can we shut I think the trunk? Have. Shut the trunk on the cars. <laughs> the trunk of the LTD. <laughs> <laughs> the gold LTD. That's it. Champagne um, colored. Yep. Yeah. Champagne, champagne color. Champagne, yeah. which is different than gold. Champagne is a little, little <laughs> different hue, but uh, yeah. but nevertheless, I, I think that's going to do it for this episode of the Thirty Three Twenty Four podcast. We've advocated for this album. It's the first album by the Cars. It's just called the Cars. Um, so just check it out. Uh, the beginnings, you know, the end, the, the ending of one era in the seventies, but the beginning of another. And and the, this band, these five gentlemen, were at the crossroads of it, um, taking those elements of rock and roll, and then adding something that was new on the horizon, and, and kind of bringing it with them into the eighties. So. 
Uh, that's going to do it. Check us out on social media. Won't you go check out uh, us on Instagram and Facebook? Uh, a lot of fun there. A lot of people hitting us up, posting mm -hmm. stuff, a lot of great conversations. If you want the video version of this, go to YouTube. Uh, you can like and subscribe there. We put out, we pretty much put out the new episodes. We've got a whole bunch of other stuff. And I've got, we've got episodes we never even uploaded. So we've got old stuff that we could even go back to also and, and put that up. So I'll start doing that as well. So for Eric, this has been Dean. We'll catch you on the flip side. You've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important. So make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 